for other purposes. Mr. President. The majority Leader. I am pleased that, the Dem that Democrats have just reached an agreement with the Republicans to pass a temporary extension of government funding tonight. We will have up to five votes, four on amendments and then final passage. This agreement is an important step because we not only avoid a shutdown on Friday, we also clear the way for passing the first six appropriations bills next week. We want to move quickly, so I ask senators to stay in their seats or near the floor until we finish our work. We're going to try, starting on the second vote, to keep votes limited to 10 minutes. So please stay in your seats. Now, Mr. President, this year, the good Lord gave us an extra day in February. So let's make sure we finish the job and don't drag this debate into March. Yield the floor. Senator from Washington. Majority Leader. Unanimous consent that all votes in this series after the first vote be 10 minutes in duration. Without objection. Senator from Washington. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I'm really glad that we have clear consensus that no one wants to see a government shutdown and that preventing one now will require a very short CR so we can continue making good progress on our full year funding bills. I've been at the table for a long time now, pushing to make progress every single day, and we are genuinely close. And if bipartisan cooperation prevails, I am very confident we can at long last, at long last, wrap up our 24 bills, our FY24 bills. And as my colleagues are aware, we plan to release the first six bills in the coming days to give everyone time to review them before a vote next week, while we continue to lock up the last six bills. I'm confident we can get all of our funding bills done in the next few weeks, so long as partisan poison pills are taken off the table. We are working in a divided government. That means to get anything done, we have to work together in good faith to reach reasonable outcomes. That has been true from day one of these negotiations, and we will only reach the last day of these negotiations if that happens. Again, Mr. President, we're close. We are moving in the right direction. It is full speed ahead, and we will keep working hard with our colleagues to get this wrapped up and take a shutdown completely off the table by passing the strongest bipartisan spending meals we can and hopefully so soon. I urge all of our colleagues to vote yes on this CR so we have the time to get these done. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President. Senator from Maine. Mr. President, several of the amendments that we will vote on propose a full year continuing resolution that would lock in dangerously inadequate funding levels for our national defense and lead to cuts in other vital programs serving our veterans, farmers, low-income families, and older Americans. In a briefing last month, the commander of U.S. Central Command told me that this is the most dangerous security situation in 50 years. The idea that we would consider hamstringing our military under a year-long continuing resolution at such a time is unconscionable. The Department of Defense has never operated under a year-long CR. It would reduce defense spending by $27 billion relative to the level called for under the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Further, there would be problems with the misalignment of funds that in many cases would prevent critical funding from being executed. For example, 30 percent of the Navy shipbuilding requests could not be spent because the funding would be misaligned. According to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, under a year-long CR, thousands of defense programs will be impacted, with the most devastating effects to our national defense being to personnel, the nuclear triad modernization, shipbuilding and maintenance, munitions productions and replenishments, and the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command priorities. Let us also remember that we would be wasting taxpayer dollars as we would forego billions of dollars in potential spending reductions and rescissions carefully identified by the Appropriations Committees. A year-long CR would result in a military that is less 
able to respond to serious security threats around the globe, and it would harm important domestic investments in biomedical research, infrastructure, and other priority areas. It would result in furloughs or hiring freezes for food inspectors and air traffic controllers, as well as slash housing assistance at a time when we already face a severe affordable housing shortage. I urge my colleagues to reject these motions and support the responsible approach of passing this short-term measure to fund the government. We will then move to the six completed conference reports on the on appropriations bills and continue our important work on the remainder of the full year appropriations bills. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President. Senator from Kentucky. I call up Senate Amendment 1614 and ask that it be reported by number. Clerk will report. The Senator from Kentucky, Mr. Paul, proposes an amendment number 1614. Mr. President, here we go again. Senators of both parties will once again kick the can down the road. Our national debt is over $34 trillion and growing at an alarming rate. The majority of the Senate meets today to vote once again for more deficit spending. We now know that the Federal Reserve is not only buying the federal debt, they're buying the debt of profligate large spending states like California, New York, and Illinois. My amendment would make it explicitly illegal for the Federal Reserve to buy the debt of these big spending profligate individual states. It was never intended that Congress give the Fed the power, and we should make sure that it is explicit. The Federal Reserve cannot buy the debt of individual states. I urge a yes vote. Senator from Minnesota. Mr. President, I rise in opposition to the Paul Amendment. As part of the effort to support our economy following the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Federal Reserve established a liquidity facility to help state and local governments better manage their cash flow and those pressures that existed as a fa that they faced as a result of the increase in state and local government expenditures related to the pandemic and the delay and decrease of some tax revenues and other revenues. And all of the funds borrowed by municipalities under this program have been repaid. So tying the Fed's hands to prevent it from helping states and municipalities, as this provision would do, would be dangerous. Congress has given the Fed the flexibility to transact in state and local bonds because we knew that it could be an important and helpful tool in times of an emergency, protecting millions of public workers, including police officers, health care workers, and other first responders. So as we have seen during the pandemic and natural disasters, uncertainty can hurt both big and small states, and the Fed's Simple ability to assist state and local governments in this way can provide stability and allow policymakers to address emerging, emerging crises. Preventing emergency programs outright would be dangerous and unnecessary. And finally, adopting this amendment would require the continuing resolution go back to the House and be voted on again. So I urge my colleagues to vote no on the Paul Amendment. Questions on the amendment? 